Hi there, welcome back. I'm still in Portugal, but I'm enjoying a nice cup of oolong tea. Special tea I first discovered when I was teaching quite many years ago in uh, Taiwan. Uh, and then I discovered that it was also up when I was working in uh, Shillong and Assam and uh, Meghalaya and places like that in the northeast of India. But guess what? Here I am in Lisbon, wandering around the streets, and I come across a Portuguese tea company. Da -da! Okay, the Campania Portuguesa de Chá. And I go in there, and there's tea everywhere. And I say to them, oh, I'm missing my oolong. Can you help? And they say, no worries. I got that. Um, and I'm drinking my oolong, which smells as good as it tastes. Tea is one of those extraordinary beverages. It has a history uh, of diversity. There's no one kind of tea. Every culture seems to have its own relationship with tea. I was writing about this many years ago, and I'll put up the article that's called Tea Bag Futures for you just, just for fun, if some of you are interested in it. It's not a set reading or anything, but it just shows you, it takes you on a journey. So I'm going to end this lecture with a, a couple of reflections on tea. And I'm not going to obviously focus on it, but other than the fact that everything, and I say this in the lecture more formally, everything has a story. Everything is anchored in culture in some way. And culture is the cumulative data set from which we draw our history. So culture is there, history is like that much. It's a slice of culture, just like all the humanities are slices of culture. You've got literature, you've got anthropology, geography, and so on. Sociology, yep, philosophy. But history is quite transdisciplinary in the sense that it draws on those other elements, probably to a greater extent often than those elements might draw on history, though I can think of a number of colleagues who would disagree. So, uh, and of course, disagreement doesn't need to be bloody fist fights. It just needs to be an intellectual process of engagement and dialogue and dialectic in which we possibly, if we're open enough, and may change our positions or modify them in some way. So let me lead, leap into um, this lecture. I'm going to go and share screen. And take you on a journey again. So there we've got the wonderful SLR, the old SLR, the cameras of my youth. Uh, now, apart from the nerds who still love their SLRs and think that they're better, and they probably, I think they are in some respects better than the digital, uh, you still can't, uh, uh, I think it's kind of like comparing um, oranges and apples or something like that uh, the SLR has its place and it gives you a in this case I'm using there because it's I'm trying to give you a snapshot of some of the things going on in week two for you so I'm not going to spend too much time dwelling on it but I think the SLR is something if you've never heard of it okay go and look it up the SLR cameras um and uh have a bit of nerdish time because there's a history in the story of the SLR. So week two, off we go. As I said last week, we are all stardust. And this means, again, we have a basis on which to think about our relationships. History is very relational. It's about the dynamics in cultures and peoples that might lead to a great pharaoh like Ramses II or a great leader like um, Joan of Arc or someone else like that. Um, so history can take us in there and help us start seeing how context determines relationships. This is where David Christian's ideas on complexity and energy and collective learning are very meaningful because they establish kind of 
boundaries or that well energy is physical complexity is relational and collective learning well that's relational too so we've got two relational elements dynamically weaving and we have energy as the basis so mark's got something right there because he he theorized that you know the forms of production are the basis for culture and civilization and in many respects he's right but there's more going on it's very easy to be over simplistic i just love this idea we are all stardust if you have a mantra you could easily adopt this one as a other mantra to go with it and if you don't have a mantra then you can start off with we are all stardust so what kind of history do we need today this is from a um, a really wonderful little tweet that I picked up. Uh, it's following a group called Women's Art. And here we've got a, a woman uh, challenging us to think of the great Michelangelo uh, and his Sistine Chapel painting through the eyes of Black femininity or Black feminism. Harmonia Rosales, you know, reimagining Michelangelo's creation of Adam. Isn't that just beautiful? And to me, it is also an incredibly clever hack where the cultural motif is being disrupted, twisted, flipped over, reframed. Okay, so the big question for us is how does history keep engaging with new insights into being human that are emerging from a wide range of disciplines, from evolutionary cosmology to neuroscience, from gender studies like this image to ecology? How do we do that? And that's a big history question. It doesn't want to change. Okay. Back to this kind of image from last week, and you'll. Well, we're not going to show the image every week, but you know, it, it should be engraved in your brains for the period of the, this course that there is an incredibly magnificently rich timeline that we can work with. And you know, uh, this is Eric Chasson's work again arrow of time from the origin of the universe to the present what i'm interested in of course is the cultural and the future the biological frames that and then the geophysical processes that precede the emergence of life which is the biological era that Chasson is talking about is each one should i say situates the conditions and develops the conditions from which the next emerges so today, and this is one of the key interests for me, because I'm a futurist as well as an historian, is that we are we can see the emergence of a set of conditions, you know, hinging on energy and on complexity and on our capacity or not to collectively learn that are framing certain kinds of future possibilities for humanity and the planet so where do we go let's keep moving uh, for some reason i don't want to do that so let's get curious have you been more curious over this week have you started to open up to the potential uh disruptions that the course might throw you and of course some of you might be totally comfortable with all of this i'm not denying that but some of you might be going where the hell is this guy taking us what the hell have i signed up for and that's a very understandable situation too. But I want to point you to the library. I did that last week, but I want to point you more specifically to the library. Because I went to the library list to find a few books that might give you different, very different insights into how we can engage with the past. So here we've got some resources for you. Tom Griffith's wonderful book, The Art of Time Travel. We use the introduction to that book in History 300 there's wonderful it's an old one but it's a classic Margaret Barbara Tuckman's A Distant Mirror it's a history of the 14th century that's the century when we had the Black Death and all that then totally different Adrian Mayer she's written an amazing book called The Amazons Lives and Legends of Warrior Women Across the Ancient World we also use a chapter from that in History 300 interestingly enough ah uh, here we go Yuval Harari he's the reading for this week isn't he and his special book Sapiens it's interesting when I go to people's homes or whatever um it's one of the books that I might see I'm more likely to see 
on their bookshelf. I was in a friend's place. I'm in Lisbon now. He's across the river, Gonzalo. And on his shelf was Sapiens, okay? Um, so it's, and he's a graphic artist. So it's it's a book that's called to many people in many different ways. Okay, and E.B. Holland, or, or the o, A with a little dot above it is an or, okay, offers us something off the, with this interesting book, Women, Pain and Death. Oh, what a great name. Is that Rituals? I'm really into them. Uh, and Everyday Life in the mar on the Margins of Europe and Beyond. Okay, so that's a very specific kind of book that's looking very specifically at certain elements of what I would call marginalized history. And finally, we've got Thomas Martin with his great book, Ancient Greece, from the prehistoric to the Hellenistic time. Hellenistic times are up to, you know, Alexander the Great and, and so on. Um, yeah, so here we've got just, you know, some great resources right in your back pocket, we might say, in the library. And of course, none of these books, well, except for Harari, are really going to feature in this course, but they are books that I'm hoping might tempt you to get more curious and go searching through them, okay? So here I am looking a bit scruffy. How come I always look scruffy? Um, <laughs> all right, talking again about historical literacy. There's so much to choose from, as those books in the previous um, uh, slide suggest. Everything is historical. Everything has a story. I'm going to sip my tea again because it's historical and story. And this cup is also featuring like that because it's very much influenced by the Ming Chinese dynasty uh, and their aesthetics of blue and white porcelain, which really captivated uh, European imagination in the 16th, 17th and 18th century. <sighs> Sign, okay. But what can we say? Everything is you say, come on, everything come. Beans have a story. Beans have a great story. Yes, beans. <laughs> Not just baked beans, because when I used to teach History 100 long ago, um, I would devote a, a, in our lecture to Australia's history of foodstuffs, Vegemite, <laughs> uh, baked beans on toast, the old Heinz stuff, um, damper, and many uh, other kinds of things, the contested history of the pavlova and so on. But yeah, so beans, what can we say about beans? Well, quite a lot, it appears, because this guy, Ken Albala, Al um, who's a wonderful American scholar, has written a book on beans, which I, you know, I just happen to have. What is interesting about this book? Well, it's interesting because it gives you a history of the bean. It was one of those first domesticated food crops. Um, but he also gives you recipes from Egypt, from Greece, from medieval Europe, from Mexico, uh, you know, in the 16th, 17th century or whatever. He gives you recipes. And I've, I've tried quite a number of them, and they're really good. So beans have a story. They're a story also of globalization because a bean might be found in, first of all, in somewhere like South America, and maybe Christopher Columbus and his gang bring it back to uh, Europe. Or oh, Europe, Europeans take beans from, because beans are very prevalent in the sort of um, context of Asia Minor, okay, um, which is often, we now should probably better call it a, a West Asia, which is sort of like Turkey, Iran, Lebanon, all those countries, and they've diversified across the world. India has its own bean culture uh, with its Urad dals and so on, um, and they've moved. Uh, and then, of course, the Chinese have a long history of with their uh, soybeans and tofu and so on. So, you know, there's just so much going on here. So, uh, and New York Times, I think this is quite funny. They call it charming, but I think it's really interesting. But, you know, I do love cooking as well. So, and I explore the world through through cooking and my taste buds like this tea. Mm. So I'm holding two magazines there. Uh, this week, we're looking at megaliths, a mega big lith stone. Megaliths, those amazing stone structures that are scattered across Europe and across into England, British Isles, and so on. Um, what were they all about? Well, you can read about them this week. All right, come on, what are you doing? 
All right. So, well, we get optimistic with uh, Sue Hetherington. I come back to her a little bit later in the lecture too. A conversation with Sue. Okay. Where's she going with uh, her ideas? She's thinking about the conditions for global citizenship. She's also written this great book, that one there, The Quiet Disruptors, okay, uh, which I wave around uh, enthusiastically <laughs> at the beginning of our chat, and we go over time. I do apologise about that, but it's just so interesting talking to Sue. She's an incredibly wise woman. She also has a great um, little website that every day without fail sends out 50, 100, 150 word thought bubble. Sometimes it's a great poem from some of the poets that she follows. Sometimes it's her own poetry. Uh, sometimes it's a just a thought bubble. Uh, so she sends this out regularly in order to kind of grow the, the imaginative and ethical context from which uh, her thinking emerges. So there's this chat with Sue. I'll come back to it in a little bit, but I, I really encourage you to have a listen to that because she talks about some of my favorite things like uh, curiosity and creativity. All right. So we'll come back to Sue. Let's get down to business a little bit. Good old David Christian. This is his cover from his big fat book, uh, Maps of Time. So as I've said multiple times now, but it's, you know, in a learning context, it always helps to repeat these things. Drawing on Chaison or Eric Chaison, Christian offers maps of complexity and thresholds as key understanding to the evolution of culture. That image from slide two or three, wherever it was, um, of the thresholds from biological to cultural to future, okay, um, are important thresholds. And, you know, I was positing when I was talking about that, that we are at a threshold now. We're at a threshold where energy, complexity, and collective learning are under pressure. And that pressure is the same sort of pressure we could we would have seen when human beings uh, started their agricultural cultures uh, millennia ago or industrial culture centuries ago and so on. So what does he have to say? Well, this is the famous quote, so, so to speak, that you guys are being asked to reflect on for your assessment one. However, the spatial and temporal maps of modern science are not the only maps, okay? They're, they're useful, but they're not the only maps, okay? Other maps tell us different stories. <gasps> um, we talked about this last week. Maps tell stories. Make a note, okay? One of the most interesting is the map of complexity. So complexity is not the same as complicated, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. Instead of comparing different objects by their size and age, we compare them by the degree of complexity. So a single-celled organism is more complex than an atom. A worm is more complex than a single-celled organism. Why? Because it's, it's a melange, you could say, a mixture, a hybridization of different single cells coming together cooperatively to create the worm. That's interesting, isn't it? And of course, then there's us at the, uh, at, you know, and mammals and highly developed uh, avian species um, and fish species and so on. So we can look at um, the single-celled amoeba and we can compare it to a star, as Christian does, and it, we can easily say, that amoeba is much more complex than the star. What's the star doing? Pretty much nothing. It's just sitting there fiddling with twiddling its thumbs uh, and, and churning uh, up hydrogen, creating helium. Okay, hydrogen to helium. Okay, two of the simplest of uh, the uh, elements on the periodic table. So, what can we say? Well, there's this tension between complexity and complication. If I gave you a book on how to put together a, the engine of a Mercedes Benz, and I gave you the tools, and I gave you all the parts, if you were literate, you could eventually, might take you some time, put together that engine. That engine is complicated, but it's not complex. Complexity or complex problems, they involve 
a lot of unknowns and too many interrelated factors to, to reduce it to rules and processes, the book on how to put together your Mercedes-Benz engine. A technological disruption like blockchain, you probably all know about chocolate, is a blockchain is a complex problem. So a competitor with an in, innovative business model, like Uber or Airbnb, they're putting together a whole bunch of stuff. It's a complex problem. There's no algorithm out there, A plus B equals C, that will tell you how to respond. There's some other thing that goes on there. The human brain can handle complexity, but often only to certain levels, and it depends on your training, depends on your cultural location, your commitment to openness and innovation. I love this um, wordle type thing here on the side of the word cloud that sort of captures that. So I want you to understand that complexity is not A equals B. It doesn't work like that. It's not linear. It's a complex system issue where what happens to uh, a fish in the Amazon will have some kind of relational dynamic with um, wind patterns and rain uh, and storms in uh, Europe, northern Europe, let's say somewhere far away okay so that's really important and of course there's been a bunch of stuff going from the 1970s and 80s on complexity theory and so on where you've got concepts like the butterfly effect which i haven't referred referenced here but it's worth looking at so we try to simplify this complexity by giving you three big ideas right energy complexity is there as one of the ideas in collective learning. Think about it. You're sitting around the campfire as a Neolithic or Paleolithic person, having been out hunting, talking about the conditions, if it was a successful hunt or a failed hunt, sitting around the fire, okay? The fire is the energy. You've been out hunting for the energy. If you're eating the leg of a mammoth or something like that, or, you know, the leg of a rabbit and you're all feeling hungry, uh, whatever it is, that's all about energy. And you're talking about <laughs> collective learning. You're talking about the conditions that led to the success or failure of that hunt. The fact that one of the people might have misheard an instruction or that, you know, there's not a lot of language there it might be very early in the evolution of human beings but you you know you're trying to sense mate and the conditions in which you were hunting whether it was ice ages and it was really cold uh, the the nature of the weather the fact that there are certain other elements um, in that context that you're describing perhaps there's a certain flower that's in bloom or a tree that's losing its leaves, or uh, wind coming from that direction or that direction. All of these things factor into how early people used to uh, respond to and map, map their context so that they could be more successful hunters or whatever it might be. So these big ideas work together, right? Okay. Now, another way of seeing those big ideas at work is Harari's idea which from this week's reading about imagined orders. And he gives us this list. There's sitting around the fire, okay? It gives us power, but it also gives us a social context. Around the fire, we gossip about the day. Then we have agriculture, which is the getting managing our environments to produce more, okay? Mythology, how do we explain the, the eagle or the bison or the bear or the fish or the fruit or the seed. These are all there. Transaction. Before we had money, of course, we would swap things for things. There is some fantastic stuff emerging from archaeology over you know many years now that illustrate that the Celts of Ireland were in contact somehow through net trade networks with Egyptians you know, centuries and centuries before the Romans showed up. Uh, flint in, and, or, and obsidian and other forms of rock or shell would move across from one side of Australia to the other through indigenous trade routes and so on. And these song lines, uh, which are just remarkable. So we can see that transaction, money, economy, uh, 
and the movement and exchange of goods is really important. There are contradictions too, and these contradictions created culture. These guys are different from me. They like oolong tea, but I don't. I like beer or whatever. Mm. And of course, science, and now he's talking about modern science, made us deadly. But science has always been in the at the service of human beings trying to understand the world around them. Okay. And science got mixed up with mythology and religion and spirituality and all those other things along the way. But these are elements. This is part of what Harari, I, I would call Harari's uh, list of ingredients, okay, that make up culture as we understand it today. Okay. But there was, and this is something that Harari is talking about, a cognitive revolution. Note that I'm nearly always referencing as well as I can uh, these ideas. And notice how I do it in brackets down here. I don't know why I didn't use brackets over there, but it's the same reference. Harari, 2014, that's the year in which my copy of his book uh, was published. But there might be different editions and so on. And I'm on page 41. The quote I'm using is in inverted commas. Now, I might teaching you to suck eggs, as my grandma might have said, but that's beside the point. I want to uh, underscore the fact that we are doing something that is academic. You're at a university and you need to reference correctly. I am a referencing nerd, okay? Some people are referencing Nazis. I wouldn't go that far, but, you know, I will take marks off you, as will Gil or Caitlin, if you... Um, screw up your referencing or you just don't reference that's that's suicide that's like throw yourself out the window here i'm on the fifth floor so it would hurt <laughs> okay so anyway let's look quickly at this so harari talking about his, the cognitive revolution so he gives us this so we've got a new ability the ability to tra transmit larger quantities of information about the world through language that's what christian would call hmm, collective learning okay then he's got a consequence on the other side. We can plan and carry out complex actions. We can build pyramids or we can organize a great hunt, you know? So this is what he's doing. And he, he says the following. The immense diversity of imagined realities that Sapiens invented, that's us, okay? And the resulting diversity of behaviors. How many different ways can we drink tea? Sip again. Are the main components of what we would call cultures, plural. Once cultures appeared, they never ceased to change and they were they are incredibly creative things, cultures. And these unstoppable alterations are what we call history. <gasps> I love it. It's a great little definition, you know. So, and Harari is an historian. And before he became famous with his smash hits, I was using one of his first articles. I just happened upon it somewhere and I thought, this is really good. And it's about uh, great battles and so on. So uh, he's he's a very good historian, very competent. Uh, you don't have to agree with everything he says. I certainly don't. But I find him provocative. And provo provocation is much better than agreement. He helps you think. You can think with Harari at your side. Okay, <gasps> assessment time. Oh no, we say. All right, well, we're on to this. Uh, we will have talked about it in week one. Uh, you're probably already playing around with Padlet a little bit, or maybe you're just using a scrap piece of paper and you're doing a mind map, okay? You've got the quote, I put it on the side here. And, you know, I'm not as brilliant at Padlet as good old Caitlin, who's going to do something special for you if she hasn't already done it. Um, and sort of walk us through how to create a good Padlet and how to conceptualize and think in this kind of way. But, you know, you come up with, this is my very simple one, and I put little labels here. So what you need to do is start thinking right now, as early as you can, about complexity. What does it mean? I've given you an example, tea or beans, you know, but it can be anything you like. If you if you particularly love beer or cheese, or if you particularly love some sport, you can look at the evolution of the ball. The ball began as a sack of um, leather, okay? But it probably also began maybe as large seed pods or something else, depends what the culture is, because cultures evolve in context, don't they? Yes, and that means what might be available to a, an Inuit person living in the very north of Canada 
where games, we all play games. Every culture plays games. But, you know, what they might have used for a ball um, would be very different from what a Mayan might use as a ball or a sub-Saharan African tribal person might use as a ball. Um, and also what somebody in medieval Europe, ancient Rome, Greece, I mean, you just keep going. So what I, I would suggest you do is you... Anchor, this is just my idea, and you can go in other directions, but I like anchoring abstract ideas like complexity in, you might say, the real world, <laughs> which is always an imagined order, but, you know, it's to say, okay, let's take something and explore it. So I'm using my tea, but you can do whatever you like with it. Uh, but the point is that it needs to be coherent. You need to evidence your thinking around complexity. More on that in the workshop, and we can touch it. We will touch upon it again next week. So, heading towards the very end here. For me, I want to say the following evolution is complex, not complicated. Referring back to that earlier slide, culture is the new field context for human evolution. Okay, it is where David Christian places collective learning and good old Yuval Harari has placed his imagined orders. Quoting myself, haha, okay, uh, I want to say the following. Essentially, culture tells us who we are. I'm a white male called Marcus living in Australia. Uh, I'm reasonably affluent and therefore protected from, you know, the hardest issues in life. I've lived for a fair amount of time, so I've got a lot of cultural memory behind me, blah, 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 okay? Simultaneously, it limits our horizons whilst offering us escape routes. What do I mean by that? Well, it tells me who I am. So I'm a white Australian male. But if I was not an academic who travels around the world and spends time in India, Brazil, here in Portugal, off to Sweden, wherever, you know, um, my horizons would be somewhat set, especially given my age and given my cultural background coming out of, you know, the 1960s and 70s in Australia. But it offers us escape routes. And this is the imagined orders that Harari is talking about, or the complex creativity and hybridity around collective learning. All you need to do is meet somebody new or different or an idea or a book or a piece of music or a piece of food, and it can take us on other journeys. Culture is never static, and that's how we get our escape routes. Culture is moving, creative, and always quite surprising, okay? To be a cultural citizen, therefore, and I could use, say, to be a global citizen, is to have a critical capacity. That means the ability to think upon our thinking, to loosen the bonds of culture upon our choices and imaginations, and to be, as good old Michel Foucault, love him, uh, might, this might be the first time you've ever encountered his name, but Foucault is a great French philosopher of the 20th century, one of the great philosophers. He puts it like this, to um, culture, uh, critical culture, critical thinking, uh, helps us be a little less governed by the politics of cultural conditioning. To be less governed in my world, means to be more free. Not totally free, but a little more free, okay? Yet freedom is a burden because it brings choice. It brings, it forces us to make choices between things. We might choose to keep on driving big V8 engine cars and consuming as much petrol as we can because, God, that feels good when you're driving down the road in a big luggy V8. Or you might choose to catch the train or whatever so because you're thinking uh, uh it's not about personal gratification or a sense of power but it's actually about my god i'm doing that and it's having these impacts down the line in a complex world of systems where we don't really know what the end result is except i can see on the horizon line in my own backyard where some tree is dying that used to be very happy climate change so we start to join the dots like that, okay? So I want to come back to Sue and uh, our discuss Sue Hetherington and my discussion with her about creativity and curiosity. So this is around the nine minutes in, and she's talking about these two elements. Uh, I just want to say, go and listen to this interview because as I said, Sue's a really wise person. 
and well worth the time. Spending 30 minutes listening to Sue uh, is going to uh, be a shot in the arm, I hope, give you a sense of where you're going. Okay, so back to my opening area of cups of tea. I have a teapot similar to that and cups very similar to that, and there's your oolong tea. Oh, God, I love you. The smell of it, the cultures around it, and the fact that, of course, it's not me on my own. I was in Sweden two months ago, um, and I met a, a, a young uh, blogger, no, not blogger, podcaster, Ingrid, and uh, we had a really great discussion, and she said, meet me in this tea shop. And there was this Chinese tea shop in the middle of, a, uh, of one of the older cities of Sweden, Uppsala, run by a really um, articulate, thoughtful, sensitive, and beautiful uh, Chinese woman who spoke really good English and she uh, and Swedish, and she walked us through a Chinese uh, preparation of the tea and so on. And she talked about the teas and she told us about her family and the fact that her brothers get impatient with the slowness of tea making because they want things right now uh, and so on. So it's really interesting. And then, of course, here I am wandering around Lisbon and I found another tea shop, a Portuguese tea shop, not with Chinese people in it, but with uh, a couple of Portuguese women, one of whom was about to have a baby. Uh, and we had this great discussion about teas and so on. I was wandering around and we were comparing all the oolongs and so on. I'm a bit of a nerd, so I know a bit about this tea and they were all quite impressed. <laughs> but apart from that, you know, um, I want to end with this idea that in a cup of tea, you will find the world. And this is me quoting myself yet again. God, it's boring, isn't it? But this time from decades before 2000, I wrote the article in 2000, it came out in the year 2001. And I'm talking about this in really interesting Japanese guy who was a, a philosopher and a tea nerd who wrote a book, 1907, uh, The Book of Tea. And he observed, wryly, as I note there, that humanity seems to meet in a tea, in a cup of tea. I go on. There are many different ways of drinking tea as there are peoples who drink it. Okay. Tea has adopted the cultural intricacies of the peoples it has come in contact with. So rather than imposing culture, it has fused with cultures, plural, and it is experienced very differently in a, in a Turkish tea shop as opposed to a Tibetan where they drink the teas, the sour milk, uh, fermented sort of milk with tea, or in Japan or China. This is a Japanese tea uh, teapot here, but you get very similar teapots in China because the two cultures are very similar in some respects, historically especially. So I go on. Unlike other commodities in the global market, which owe their success to their uniformity, oh, I know where to get a cup of coffee wherever, for instance, tea is unique in that it is a heterodox, that means multiple phenomena, that means all over the place, many different faces, you could say, blending into each culture and being identified with it as an essential part of our social discourse. Like Ingrid, the uh, podcaster said, come and drink a cup of tea with me. And it was a special cup of tea. And we were offered a whole range of teas, green, oolong, black, and so on. Oolong sits in between black teas um, and uh, let's say like, uh, I'm thinking English breakfast or something really common like that. Not that I quite like English breakfast, but so it's there. And on the other end, you've got white tea and green tea, which are non fermented tea. So long sits in the middle. Um, so we have this meeting in a Chinese tea shop in Uppsala. She's Norwegian by background. Okay. And there I am, an Australian, and we're meeting over a cup of tea. Smell the tea. take time. Tea should be consumed slowly. Find a Chinese or Japanese or other kind of tea shop near you. I don't know if we got them on the Sunshine Coast, um, but it's worth having a look and seeing what you find. If you find a really good tea shop on the Sunshine Coast, tell me. I'll be down there in a flash. So the last slide then is from uh, Okazura, 
um, Kaikuzo. Sorry, I'm I'm going blank for a moment because I'm thinking there isn't a Z in Okakura. It's not Okazura. Um, and he says the art of life consists in constant readjustments to our surroundings, to our context. So world history, global citizens are um, constantly readjusting to our surroundings. Human beings now have dominated the planet in a certain way. And I would argue, this is the final thought for today, that we are being invited to rethink our relationship with our planet, the animals, the plants, the geophysics, the, um, what do we call it, the hydrosphere and the biosphere and uh, the atmosphere and so on, because these are all part of complex relationships and we've thought foolishly in some respects that we can control all of these but no we're part of it we're on you know the team page so that's where i end with the art of life lies in the constant readjustment to our surroundings okay so that's called being flexible and i really think that's important I want to thank you again. Hope this was interesting and I look forward to catching up with you next week.